involvement are in many phases. Direct involvement, protective involvement. Oh. Yeah, that's a protective involvement. Okay. Oh, we, clear, we clear the road for you. Oh. We we'll, and look another way. We'll look, we'll these are these we'll are we look away. These are Trusting. these are indirect involvement, and sometimes they look away, even earn more money than the direct involvement. Oh. So why don't we create an outfit? We can create an outfit. Even in fighting corruption, we created an outfit. Even though corruption fighting was a, a case of the police alone, but we created an outfit to handle it specifically, dedicated to it, and trained. Now let's begin this conversation taking a quote from Steve Irwin, nicknamed the Crocodile Hunter. He was an Australian zookeeper, um, conversationalist, he was a TV personality, wildlife expert, and environmentalist. Irwin grew up around crocodiles and other reptiles and was educated um, regarding them by his father, Bob. He once said, I believe our biggest issues is the same biggest issue that the whole world is facing and that's habitat destruction. All right, our next quote is from Andres Malm, Swedish author and an associate professor of human ecology at Lund University. He once said, property destruction still happens. It's just done by wrong people for very wrong causes. Hmm. Now let's see how all of this goes relate to what we'll be discussing tonight. Very warm greetings and welcome to The Conversation. We're reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. I am Annabel Oji. No fewer than 1,166 ex-militant leaders under the Niger Delta Presidential Amnesty Program Phase 2 have given the federal government a 14-day ultimatum to direct its special advisor on the Presidential Amnesty Program, PAP, as Colonel Miland Dikio retired, to pay them their over one-year outstanding 64,000 Naira monthly allowance or they would resort to protest. Speaking on behalf of the ex-militant leaders, chairman of the group, John Esuku, claimed that the refusal of the amnesty office to pay over 6,000 ex-agitators their monthly stipend for the past one year has driven jobless youth into the region to return to the creeks to resume artisanal crude refinery. As, um, as, as Esuku further explained that despite several letters to the amnesty office to resolve the issues surrounding the non-payment of stipends to beneficiaries, the federal government has gone ahead to pay billions of naira for pipeline surveillance contract. Now on the show today, we have Sleek Oshari. He is an oil and gas expert and he's also a Niger Delta development advocate. And we also have joining us via Skype is Teba Atsa, who is there in River State. He will give us all that is happening in the area to join us again if you just joined us this is the conversation we are reaching you from kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital abuja now we'll go straight to the interview and our discussion for today i guess here in the studio we have um, Sleek Oshari, he is an oil and gas expert and he is a Niger Delta activist. You're welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. It's great to have you again. Nice to see you too. Likewise. Mm -hmm. All right, we have joining us there via Skype is engineer Teva Atsa. He is an environmental technologist. It's good to have you on the show, sir. Thank you very much. All right. Now we'll start with you, Engineer Teve. Now you're on ground there in the creeks in Port Harcourt. Give us the current situation report in the area, where you stand at the moment. What can you tell us? Well, there's a relative calm. I've uh, been here for the past uh, 19 years. And I can say that in the past, there used to be outright bombing of pipelines and uh, Casualties were also involved. But now we have uh, pockets of uh, incidents happening once in a while. So I think there's relative calm in terms of pipeline vandalization at the moment. Oh, okay. So, uh, like some people say, that there's um, the kind of um, silence that you notice in the Niger Delta area is kind of um, the piece of the graveyard. Would you term it as that? 
well, like I said, there are pockets of incidents in the uh, industry. No incident can be hidden because mm -hmm. it has impacts on uh, the operations. When there's a pipeline rupture, either the community involved is affected and the operator who is losing oil is also affected. So there is hardly any, any pipeline event that can be kept secret. So I think those who are saying um, in silence of the graveyard, is, uh, they may have their reasons. But I think from my point of view, the incidents have reduced drastically. All right then. So now I know that you're right there at work in the creek. In fact, I know that um, that's where you are uh, currently in, talking to us from Port Harcourt. Now, how do you manage to surround yourself with all of these militants in the creek who are, who we know that they are heavily armed and most times they, they're always faceless. Someone told me some time ago that when they went there a few years ago to mount telecoms mass, they had to send heavy escorts to and fro because it was really tight and scary and only for the brave hearted. So how do you deal and even make a living for 19 years, you said, of, out of such fierce looking arena? Uh, funny enough, I've not come face to face with the militant in the past 18 years that I've stayed here. Oh. I'm not come face to face with a militant. So so you see, some of these things are uh, at a far, at a distance, they sound more terrible than on the ground. Oh, okay. You remember really? when we were having the, the war in Af Afghanistan, some of us here thought the whole place has been leveled to the ground. Mm -hmm. But uh, there were people living there having their normal life. The same thing happened in Iraq. When reporters made the news, they would make it sound like the whole of Iraq. Now he's has been reporters leveled. again. <laughs> but Interesting. people were living their normal lives. So here in the Niger Delta, yes, there are militants. Uh, they have their creeks where they rule, and they have warlords, they have leaders, they have gangsters who coordinate their activities. Some of them prominently came out and identified themselves. You have the men, you have the natural data volunteer force and all that. They came out openly and said they are confronting the government for certain reasons. Mm. Why some of them did not come out, uh, they are criminals. They are just happy on the environment and the resources that are available for them to steal. So such ones, stay in the creeks, when they have opportunity, they break the pipeline and steal the oil. So it's a mix of criminality and agitation. On the agitation part of it, you remember there was a time the government granted amnesty. Mm. The Yeradua government granted the amnesty to the militants. Some of them came out and surrendered their arms so they have not been involved in uh, active uh, militancy anymore. Why some of them went back, they said the government did not uh, meet all their promises Militant. to them. Mm. So some of them broke ranks and went back to the creeks. Mm. But their main leaders are no more in the creeks. Uh, yesterday I was uh, with Asari Dakubo in uh, Buja. And uh, he's not in the creeks, you know. So they are no more uh, coordinating the, the resistant bit of it. Bulk of what is happening is criminality, stealing of uh, oil okay. from pipelines. And recently, uh, the governor of Rivers State clamped on some of the illegal refineries. Yeah. They were producing a lot of black soot. Mm. The whole of Portacos was covered with black dust. So uh, the governor has to go personally in the creeks and lead the war against uh, some of these elements. So as I'm talking to you now, the level of dust has reduced. Before, every one minute, you need to clean your table, otherwise it becomes black mm. with soot. 
but at least we can breathe some clean air now. So I'm not saying these activities are finished, but they are reduced drastically. And outside of here, they are mostly integrated. They, uh, some of us that are here, we live normal lives. We wake up in the morning, we go to work, we come back. Even in the creeks, I've told almost all the creeks of the Niger Delta, both in the western and eastern region. I've told all the, the crannies of the creeks as part of my job. I never came face to face with a militant, like I said. <coughs> Sometimes before they attack, the women announce, they will tell you we are coming. And they will tell other, and they will tell you to shut down and remove your workers because they are coming. Mm. So those operators that heeded their warning, they will leave. And they will always leave good to their threat. But now, bulk of what we're having is criminality. I can say that uh, confidently. That militants who are hiding under criminality to rupture pipelines, they are not agitating for anything. Mm. They are just looking for their personal uh, gain because they say the oil and make money. Uh, I'll stop there for now. They're looking for their personal gain, but yet you have the government saying that over 80% of our revenue is dwindling with regards to this militant activities and crude oil theft. Now, let's come to you. Um, slick Oshari, with all that he said, I hear you, I see you nodding your head in agreements. Do you agree, hook, line, and sinker, and everything that he said? That's what on the side. And then, secondly, he talked about how much the River State government have, has uh, actually clamped down on illegal refinery. But then, someone somewhere actually, I don't know if I should call it like carelessly stated that if these illegal refineries are allowed to operate and then given the legal, are allowed to operate legally as some kind of, um, uh, uh, what do, do they call those small refineries? As some kind of, um, I'm trying to look for that word again. I, I'm trying to come back to my head. So if they are allowed to operate legally, that is not a, actually a problem. So would, do, you, do you agree to that? You see, the thing that we Nigerians, we are very mischievous. We lie to ourselves just to, be, just to popularize ourselves to be hard. First, I'll start from the first question, which he has said. I don't believe that militants are stealing oil. Militants are vandalizing pipelines. The people vandalizing pipelines are, are criminals. Militants agitate for development of Niger data. Oh, and okay. when they agitate and the government is not listening to them, they disrupt oil operations. That's what militants do. They don't vandalize they, pipelines. They, they, they don't vandalize pipelines to steal crude. Those who vandalize pipelines to steal crude are criminals. So what do you, what's the difference between what they do? And There's a difference between an arm robber and a protester. That's a clear difference. The militants agitate for development of the area of Niger Delta, the, of the Niger Delta region, and for good oil feed practices, which will produce less uh, the pollution of the area. And when government doesn't listen to them, they disrupt oil operations. Criminals steal crude oil, vandalize pipeline to steal crude oil. So if anybody, there's local cases where there could be a the person could be a militant as well as uh, make himself uh, a criminal that is going beyond the purpose of being Militancy. militant. Okay. So that's the way, uh, that's what I would say. If you say Asari Dokubo, for example, is a militant, Asari Dokubo doesn't vandalize pipeline. It doesn't stay crude away. You see? So you can see the difference between being a militant and being a criminal. And you see many of the people who are vandalizing pipelines and stealing crude oil, they were not even in the militancy. They capitalize in the situation created by the militants to do what they are doing. And of course, there are militants who also decide to join those criminals. Then that militant is no longer a militant, but it's not a criminal. So we need to get out of that. Uh, now, I'm talking about uh, this, uh, what they call illegal, illegal refineries. refineries. And then First of all, let's look at that, what we call the, those refineries. Let's look at those refineries. We are going to look at them in two aspects. One, if you own a refinery, if you have to go to the refinery, how do you get the oil to refine? Do you, guys, do you steal oil from other places to refine? 
Those illegal refined, they steal oil to refine. That itself is criminality. Why are you stealing something that belongs to something somebody else is uh, spending money and everything to bring out for God? You steal it from the person to refine it and you say we should legalize you on that. That is wrong. <laughs> that is wrong. It's like having a corn meal, a corn flour meal. You can steal corn from other person's farm and then you say uh, you do it out to process it's and so you should get it. That mm. is wrong. So if you want to have your own uh, refinery, there are two processes. One, get a specification on the refinery, get a license for it, build the refinery to standards that will turn up products that meet with specification for usage. Okay? And in the process of doing it, you must meet with environmental uh, a standard. Okay. So, and like what he just complained about, it, 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 black it, it, dust. Yes, so you have to meet with the standard of environment. So we have to, first, the, the facilities you use, the equipment which should be standard. The product are going to come out which should be standard to meet the API or uh, ASTM uh, specification good enough for everybody to use. And then you must produce it in such a way as not to damage the environment. That's another one. The other one, that the, pro, the oil you are going to produce, that's your, your input, your, your, your throughput, your product. The things you are going to bring in, your raw material you are going to bring it, must be legally acquired. It has to be legally acquired. Dan Gote is building a refinery. He is going to buy oil to produce it, and they have given him license. So when you say illegal, it's illegal, totally illegal in every matter surrounding it. How about those people that has um, multiple or maybe even one oil well? Oil well. When people talk about oil well, people talk about oil well. How many people have oil well? You can't have an oil well except you have an oil mining lease. You have to have an oil OPL oil uh, uh, producing uh, license, oil producing license, OPL, which means you have to get a lease. And within the lease, there are several wells within a lease. Mm. There are several wells within. People use the, well, the word oil well very loosely. And it goes with that. And you can't have an oil well without having oil, an oil mining lease. You have to have a lease which gives you a big area, a very big area that has been started, that has been marked out that, let's say the whole of Abuja, the whole of FCT, the whole of FCT may, may be more than two leases. So if you have that, uh, let's say my tama is one lease. Without my tama that is an oil lease, oil, 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 oil mining lease, you can have about 30 wells within that place. And those 30 wells, you produce them into a, a center where you need to process the, you have to process the oil first. You need to clean the oil of water, what you call dehydration. You have to dehydrate, you have to dewater it. Because when you are bringing the oil out, the, the whole volume liquid you are bringing out, maybe only 60% of it is oil, 40% will just be water and sludge. So you need to clean it up because if you take all of it along into a good refining process, the water itself will destroy the equipment. So oh. you need to you need to clean it. You need to clean the, the oil out. And that oil, that water, you need to take the water out. And because that water is not pure, if you just dump into the environment, it may pollute the drinkable water in that environment. So there are a lot of process involved. And the baby the one oil well will not even give you enough. An oil well will not even be able to produce 10,000 barrels a day. Mm. An oil well may not be able to produce 10,000, maybe produces about 3,000 or 2,000 barrels a day. So you need several oil wells like that, that can produce. When you imagine the whole country producing 2.4 million barrels a day at the peak of time, we have, you know, in that place we have over. 3,000 or 6,000 oil wells, wells to produce that volume. Mm. So these are the things. So uh, when is the illegal refinery? We are, at the time, 
in 1990, in between 1990 and 1990, 1998, 18, 18 licenses were granted for private refineries. At the time, even went to 22 licenses. Approved. We want a refinery. Yeah, they apply. They approve. So to produce a, a 100,000 barrels a day, so to produce a 30,000 barrels a day, they were approved. <laughs> but what happened? None of the licenses took up their licenses. They oh. came around and told the federal government, oh, well, we have given out our licenses. Approved for us to Fun. buy and export so, so volume of crude oil for two years so that we can get enough money to establish the refineries that you have approved for us. You see the, you see the mischief in that. You want that licenses. We give you licenses. You say, no, we want us, give us. Uh, they thought by just, we will give you licenses. We will give you a bulk purchase agreement to supply you crude. But they say, no, we can't be the refineries yet because we don't have the money. So if you allow us to export crude, give us crude allocation, crude allocation produced by us so that we can sell outside. In the process, we realize profit so we can come and set up our refinery. You show the mischief. Mm. All right. So not that the government is not ready to grant licenses. In fact, as we are talking about, talking now, licenses have been granted. You have heard of Orient Petroleum in Anambra State. Mm. Which is going, which is going. I think uh, Emeka Anyoko who is the chairman of that company. He's going. These are legal ones coming out. Follow the process. The government is said to give to you. In fact, if you want experts, who will guide you? Government will even get to people who have, uh, and there's an array of experts who are vacant there who you can hire. So, but they don't to guide you. believe that it has been monopolized. That's the reason why they don't even push forward. There's no, mono, there's no monopoly. We are not, that's why I say, we Nigerians, we are not honest with ourselves. We politicize everything. We politicize everything as we are talking about. How are they taking care of the radius? How did they dispose of it? That's why they are damaging the entire environment and the communities. I blame them. I really pity them. The communities, because of what they give to them, they allow these things to exist. All right. I'm polluting the whole system. All right. Now let's quickly go. Let's talk about um, this pipeline surveillance contract, which has actually created a lot of hue and cry. And we know that it has created quite a lot of dust, especially between uh, some Niger Deltans and then the Ejaws, and then even some non Niger Deltans have even come out to say that um, that has nothing to do with it. They've come out to say that the federal government should coin out something and at least so that they can also gain somehow. And they just begin to wonder how when even the pipeline is not passing um, your area. Now with all of this that is going on, correct me if I'm wrong, I remember that um, this ongoing um, contract has been there even before uh, former president uh, Yaradua, mm -hmm. even before his death, and then after his death, and then you have it still, I think it's like it took off during um, Good Luck Ability, uh, Ability Jonathan's uh, administration. Yeah. Then later it was given to a particular um, contract, it was contracted to a particular people. Mm -hmm. This administration removed it from, okay, Tom Polo, mm -hmm. and then later they returned it back to him. But then you have some people who have been complaining that why do you have to, even some people from the Ejaws saying that, or the Niger Delta saying that, why do you have to con give it to a particular person or this particular person? But then somebody came out to say that, why do the Niger Deltans have to fight over it with the Niger Deltans? Is it, shouldn't it be like a protest between them and the government? Well, uh, when I read of uh, the the contract given to uh, given out for private uh, individual to provide security because in other words you, the individual is to provide security over the pipeline to prevent vandal vandalization and uh, I'd, I'd ask myself where is the Nigerian where is the Nigerian police where is the Nigerian navy where is the Nigerian army and where is the Nigerian air force and I had thought that um, if we think an individual can provide uh, the security for that pipeline, then the Nigerian Navy, the Nigerian Air Force, the Nigerian Police, and the Nigerian Army can be made to do it better. 
by setting up special squad in order to run those areas, provide a security. You see, in the US, there's a section of the military that came out of, out of necessity. They call it the U.S. Marines. Mm. The U.S. Marines were created especially for foreign wars that especially bordered in, around the ocean, around seas, the U.S. Marines. So it's a specialized unit. And of course, they now have the U.S. National Guard. So I think that if, if we think uh, vandalization of the pipeline has become a chronic problem, then the Nigerian military, Nigerian defense system, the Nigerian military defense system would have been able to come out, our government would have been able to come out to create a special squad dedicated, trained, funded, and equipped for that purpose. So it becomes a government unit rather than a, an individual unit. Because once you give an, a, a equip an individual mm. to that essence, a time will come when that outfit will start uh, competing with government for specific areas of authority. Looking at that that way, I think uh, it, it doesn't sound good. Uh, to me or to some of us. And then, of course, thinking about the huge sums involved, mm -hmm. and I'm hearing about four billion monthly, mm -hmm. and if you say four billion monthly, you're thinking about 1% or 5% of the total, oil, a total income from oil. You are signing to one individual. Why wouldn't other people in that region get agitated? Why would they get angry? Because that person may become may become even more powerful than the governors of those regions put together. There was a time where the MD, the MD of NDDC alone, was almost more influential than the governors of those areas because his budget was higher than the budgets of some of those states put together. So now you are having an individual pushing that place, total control, with such amount of money and for, I, 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 I accorded him. He will become so individual, so there will be jealousy. The other rivals. Yes, who were, if, I, I know where you're going to <laughs> so because you have on. some people who uh, have actually. And then, I will, then I'm coming. Then you do that in that place. And I understand some you, some other regions of the country also protested. So a time will come, if this one says true, we are having banditry now. We are having banditry. And in the Northeastern states, we have the joint tax, uh, the civilian, the, the, the civilian joint, joint tax, tax force, force yes. uh, the volunteer, volunteer force in the northeast, uh, helping government, helping a government to fight Boko Haram. So a time may come, some people will not come and say, well, maybe you need to get, need to give contracts to, so, to somebody who is so powerful there, also to fight banditry or to fight Boko Haram. You see, we must be careful of the implications of things we do. Mm -hmm. We must be careful, such, such that we do not undermine the basis of governance, the basis of government, and why government exists. You actually answered the next question I was going to ask you, because a lot of people have been arguing that this pipeline actually passes through their own area. Mm -hmm. You don't only have one state where you call the Niger Delta state or the oil producing state. You still have other states like um, Cross River, Edo, Delta, Ondo, Imo, Akwaibom, um, Bayelsa, and Abia. And then what if they decided to wake up tomorrow and then start agitating that, okay, how will you give one person and all of that? So you've yeah. actually touched on that question. Now, my yeah. next question is very quickly, before we go back to Engineer Teve. Now, we know that uh, around 2014, this administration went that route of giving it to this particular individual. So if they had to come back again to give it to this individual, does it mean that, like they say, the reward for good work is more work? Does it mean that the, for them going back this route again, he did well at the time? Uh, I, I wouldn't know, but what I did know was that when the amnesty program was put in place, there was uh, there was more dis there was less disruption of oil operations, and he was one of the main characters in making sure that oil operations were not really seriously disrupted. That was what I do know, but I also know that he wasn't involved in pipeline vandalization. 
but he and his team and all of them, the, the, the militants at that time, their leadership, the leaders of the militants at that time, put in place a situation where oil operations were less disrupted. But you see, what uh, sometimes I try to believe that the government is more easily uh, blackmailed into succumbing to, indiv to, to individuals and groups that they cannot handle. Mm. Right. That is what I see. And then I also suspect that people benefit from this kind of arrangement. And like, you to put a face to it. Uh, we can't put a face to it, but we know those, if we, we can only put a face to it if we know the architect, the authors that script up this arrangement. Then we, from there we can get the face of say, oh, let's get there and then we can get this one to do it for us and they go to the oh, boy, we are doing this for you, but you know. That All cannot. Right. So we are made. We are made. We can't prove it, but we are made to suspect some of these things that uh, go like that. So that's what I would say. That's what I would say. Government should rather create a dedicated uh, security outfit, coined if from the four major agencies of defense in this country: the army, the navy, the air force, and the police. All right. Even though we know that they are, they are also uh, there. Yeah, and we don't want to say they are there. Are you going to tell this young man to come if the if the if, uh, military officers are involved in this thing? Because the, your invo involvement are in many phases: direct involvement, protective involvement. Oh. Yeah, there's also protective involvement. Okay. Oh, we clear we clear the road for you. Oh. We we'll, and look another we'll look, way. We'll, these are these we'll are we we'll look away. These are these are indirect involvement, and sometimes they look away even earn more money than the direct involvement. Wow. So why don't we create an outfit? We can create an outfit. Even in fighting corruption, we created an outfit. Even though corruption fighting was a, a case of the police alone, but we created an outfit to handle it specifically, dedicated to it, and trained. We could train them specially. This is the squad to it. You remember, for example, mo mobile police, uh, what we call, uh, is it military police or mobile police? Mm. Was it original with the Nigerian police? Mobile police was created when political riots were coming out, especially in the Western region at that time. So it became dedicated as called riot police became dedicated to quell, to go to such places and deal with that system and command. That All was right. how mobile police was. All so right. I think since this uh, problem has become endemic, we create a special military outfit, outfit, fund it, train people, even if it means recruiting people from the militants, hmm. recruiting All people right. from the militants into it, become a specialized outfit. Hmm. I think if we do that, we may we may ruffle more, we may ruffle less feathers, we may achieve better results and jury results, and then we move forward. Everybody will be happy. I hear you say military outfit, and then you keep hopping on it. And that's one thing I've picked out from what you just yeah. stated. Mm -hmm. So now let's go on this quick break. And when we return, we'll continue this conversation with engineer Teve Atsa and Sleek Oshari. See you shortly. Mm -hmm. The whole idea mm -hmm. was to train you and give you skills so you can go and fit into the society and work and make money. It was not supposed to be you be paying you money every month. To the extent you wake up today and say they are owing you, they should come and they pay you otherwise you are giving up the methods. That was not the initial intention of the amnesty. But like the system in Nigeria is, I believe somebody has wanted that office to remain so that he can be at the head of it and be receiving monthly budget from government as budget to the office of the amnesty and they are sitting on that money somebody is ripping from it and that is why we are generating all this on the thrones mm. as for me i don't believe any militant should be coming to claim a monthly allowance at this stage
If you just joined us, this is The Conversation. We are reaching you from Kaftan's television studio here in the nation's capital, Abuja. If you just joined us, you've missed out on a lot, but then you can still join in the conversation. So we still have Engineer Teve Atza, who is joining us in Port, from, in Skype in Port Harcourt, and then we have Sleek Oshari here in the studio. Now, before we went on that break, I'll come to you, Engineer Teve. Now, we not learned that no fewer than 1,166 ex-militant leaders under the Niger Delta Presidential Amnesty Program Phase 2 have given the federal government um 14 day ultimatum to direct its special advisor on the presidential amnesty program that's Cornell millard to pay them their over um one year outstanding of 64 thousand naira monthly allowance or they would resort to protest as they claim that the refusal of this amnesty office to pay over six thousand ex-agitators their monthly stipend for the past one year have driven jobless youth in the region to return to the creeks and to resume um, the illegal crude refinery and bunkering. Now, of the federal government, if the federal government rather made this ex militant to embrace amnesty before we went on that break, we had Sleek Oshari said um, so many things with, in that regard. If they made them to embrace amnesty at the time and even drop their weapons, we actually saw that on TV and all. How come they're able to get more weapons and return to the creeks? Is there something that Nigerians are missing out here? Okay, I want to comment on the earlier part of your question before I go to the later part. Okay. Which has to do with how they get money to get arms. Uh, I'm so surprised that I know what Yaradua had in mind when he brought up the issue of amnesty. He gave a clear timeline and said, if you are a militant and you come out now within this time and October this year, and you lay down your arms, we are going to forgive you and take you in as a repentant uh, child. And then we will train you and rehabilitate you. Anybody that does not come out by October of that year will be treated as a criminal and the government will deal with him in a way he deems fit. So, but Yaradua never lived to implement that amnesty. To my surprise, the amnesty became an ongoing concern where people were just recruiting uh, even innocent people as retired militants. I happen to be one of the trainers that trained ex-militants in Ghana. And I interacted with some of these boys. Some of them told me they are not militants. They are graduates. That they have uncles, they have their brothers in the system that just put their names so that they can receive training abroad. Uh, so you find out that they corrupted the initial amnesty by changing it into a continuous program where people were recruited and be paying stipends. The whole mm. idea was to train you and give you skills so you can go and fit into the society and work and make money. It was not supposed to be you be paying you money every month. To the extent you wake up today and say they are owing you, they should come and they pay you, otherwise you are giving up tomatoes. That was not the initial intention of the amnesty. But like the system in Nigeria is, I believe somebody has wanted that office to remain so that he can be at the head of it and be receiving monthly budget from government as budget to the office of the amnesty. And they are sitting on that money. Somebody is reaping from it. And that is why we are generating all these undertones. Mm. First, for me, I don't believe any militant should be coming to claim a monthly allowance at this stage. The whole idea was that we harvested, we harvested those who repented. We sent them out for training. Some of them are pilots now. Mm, true. Some of them are, yeah, we train them in different aspects. So the whole idea was the number of militants that were, was to be trained was to be finite. It wasn't an elongated chain where we keep bringing in people. No. Because people were just claiming to be militants because they wanted to join the the amnesty queue and be collecting allowances. And this is the way we manage everything in Nigeria. We bastardize it. We change the original intention. People think, think of ways they can exploit it for their personal gain. Uh, as my uh, elder brother was talking, I was listening to some of the things he was saying, the passion. 
But what we're missing really is this. We have a joint task force in the Niger Delta that is made up of the Army and the Navy and the police and whatever that was dedicated to this pipeline. They are still in the Greeks, as I talk to you now. So even if you create a new task force, call it whatever name, after six months, they will see the benefits of colluding with these criminals better than doing their normal work. We have the uh, NS, uh, uh, NCDS, uh, what's their name again? NSCDC. Uh, security defense. Uh -huh. Their job is mainly to protect pipelines. Their job is mainly to protect pipelines. Why have they not been uh, uh, deployed to do that? And then the bit we're also missing the technology bit of it. You cannot protect pipelines through a uh, through a uh, physical uh, surveillance like that. These things are they are running hundreds of kilometers in very terrible terrain. So say you are going to be policing them 24 hours. It's a Herculean tax. What technology have given us now is that it is possible for me to sit down here on a computer and detect an intrusion 70 kilometers away on a pipeline. Mm. Okay? So it is just as we install our pipelines, we put pipeline uh, intrusion detection systems. And these systems are capable of knowing when you are digging the pipeline. They know when you are just moving a vehicle along the pipeline. They know when you have ruptured the pipeline. So if we can combine technology with this thing, we don't need a militant to be uh, patrolling our pipeline. But but what then, sorry to cut in there, a few no, years ago, I remember um, the go federal government, I think it was NMPC, that actually um, showed Nigerians a particular um, like a monitor, a, a control room where you can actually see or follow or track the activities of uh, pipeline movement and all. Was it that that at some point it's not working anymore? Like I, like I said, people want to subvert the real processes so they can create room to steal money. I'm telling you, every Nigerian has this tendency to find a way in the system where they can exploit it and make money to themselves. Go to the army, the same thing is happening. All this insurgency we are talking about in the north is because some generals are sitting on the money that should have been used to feed these people, boost their morale. Sometimes it's not even the guns. Sometimes they have a gun and they don't have food in the in, in the forest. How do you how, they are human beings? They cannot fight the militants when they are hungry. And somebody is sitting on the budget and is eating that money. So these are things that are happening. So even uh, the amnesty program you mentioned, uh, those guys that are claiming they want to go back to the Greeks, where they will get their weapons, I don't know. I don't know, but they always have their ways. But I wouldn't be the one telling you where they get their weapons. I'm not one of them. But there are weapon suppliers all over the place. Nigeria is one of the most weaponized countries now, as I speak. Small arms are everywhere. And then you find uh, uh, arms headsmen in the north going around with AK-47. Where do they get it? I don't know, but they get it anyway. Mm -hmm. So that's the second part of your your question. But for the first part, I think the amnesty issue has been elongated beyond my expectation. Those who were recruited and trained should go into the society and work and earn a living. Being a militant is not a profession. It's not, a, it's not a right to come and be claiming allowances every month. From whose pocket? From our budget? I don't agree with that. Mm. Thank you. All right. Now, I'm going to ask you two questions, and I'd like you to unbond them in one breath, even as our time is fast spent. Now, you have some of these quick men, even those in from Ijo or Calabari, feeling disgruntled and saying that they were sidelined from the government's um, contract granted to Tom Polo and that they are asking or saying that the what is good for the goose is equally good for the gander so do you think that their argument is tenable that's one on the side and secondly now with the pipeline surveillance contract awarded to him how will this benefit the niger deltans how will this even benefit also people like you who are legitimately making a living from the creeks it will not benefit me it will also not benefit uh, the average Niger Delta, but it will benefit some few people who are owners of those contracts. 
and then the people in government who are facilitating those contracts and uh, getting kickbacks from them. Those are the only people who will benefit from that uh, arrangement. I am totally against such an arrangement because it makes no meaning. Uh, as my colleague was saying, you go to the north and call one ex bandit or even uh, a Boko Haram uh, leader and tell him that you are handing over security of the north to him. And then you'll be paying him more than the budget of the states. In my state, we have one pension we're up to 70 billion. We can't pay it over, over seven years. And one person is getting four billion every day. And what is that? There is no call for it. It's just because we have succumbed to these people. And there are some people who see what they can gain from it. They went ahead and approved such an arrangement. It's an avenue for them to also be stealing. But on the side of those other uh, groups who are saying what is good for the follow is good for them, fine. That argument is valid. If you can do it to one section, why not do it to eat to the other? Mm -hmm. So from their own point of view, they are saying if you do this to this man, do it to us also because we are also bona fide uh, Niger debtors. Okay. But for me, doing it to one is even wrong. Okay. Doing it to one is wrong. You don't give a cat uh, your 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 meat to keep for you. It's not done anywhere. Right. So I believe that contract is wrong. If the government can look at it again, they should. If uh, uh, if uh, Don Polo has militants who have repented and they want to join the Nigerian security forces to man, because they are very familiar with the terrain, those people can navigate the creeks better than any other person. Because when I was going around, I always needed a guide. Because before you go to the area, they know where the waves are. They know when the waves are high. They know when they can navigate and pass certain creeks and get to wherever they are going. You as a stranger, I won't be able to do it. So mm -hmm. if we recruit them into the army, the navy, the civil defense force and all that, then they can also help us to man the pipelines and protect them. But giving that contract to one person, I think we are just uh, patronizing uh, criminality, and we are encouraging others to go into militancy so that can, they can also be patronized. All right. That's interesting. My own and let's get your landing thought on this. I'm going to ask you two questions now. With all that he said, he has, is actually disagreeing with the contract. Now, do you actually also disagree with it? And how much would that even increase Nigeria's OPEC quota if it will it will at all? That's one on the side. And then secondly is. Most of the pe most people believe that the problems of the Niger Delta are from the Niger Deltans because they don't have one voice. They don't talk, speak with one voice. So they are their own problems. Do you agree with that arg argument? Very quickly. The first question is that I have said before, I disagree with giving a contract, such a contract to an individual. I said they should, uh, government should set off a, a specific outfit, a specific military outfit. Maybe populated or with recruitment from people of that region, trained specially under the Nigerian military system to tackle that thing. Like I said, I gave example of U.S. Marine and I gave example of uh, the Navy SEALs in the mm. U.S., things like that, that. That contract should be done because it's going to create more problems than it will solve. Uh, then uh, coming about people speaking with one voice. The Niger data people speak with one voice. The one voice they speak with is agreement when it comes to sharing the money. That is their own voice. That is one voice. The one voice is silence. You see, we have had the case of the NDDC management board. According to the law of setting of NDDC, there must be a board. But since Akpabio became minister, That's the, they're still dragging about uh, that. No, no, no board. A board. A no board. And the whole of the Niger data is quiet about it. That is one voice. That is a voice. That silence is one voice. Why is it like that? And it's saying Be something. They're saying something. Even though they're silent. They are silent, saying something because they agree with it. Which means because they are benefiting from it, they agree with it. That's one voice. Interesting. That's exactly what I'm saying. Mm. The Niger data people have never come out to oppose a situation where the NDDC itself has not achieved any development for the region. Other than the new secretariat, they are just open. Nothing. 
The east-west route for over eight years has not been reconstructed. The five indices, what we say, that with indices of uh, development, none of them have been achieved. Good road network, none. Healthcare services, good healthcare services across the, the region, none. Portable water across the region, none. Enhanced education, none. Uh, communication uh, gadgets, I industries, none. No industries to be built to employ the youths, the men and women of that region. None have been established by the NDDC. And then none. you don't talk about the environment, then the degradation the, uh, of the environment. The uh, uh, remediation of the pollution in the environment has not improved, no. Have the Niger, uh, the, have the Niger data people protested against it? No. So there's one voice. Well, we've been, we've been seeing them protest with regards to the degradation of the um, no, environment. No, they do. I tell the Ogoni people, they do. Exactly. Yes, well, when there's money, no. But the master plan for the end, this, these are the, uh, the, uh, the things, the fundamentals, the cardinal points. No. And the Niger data people don't say anything wrong with that. And they keep quiet. So they are speaking with one voice. Why are they speaking with one voice? Because the shiftings, the powers that be in that region, the politicians in that region are benefiting. You know how many trillions have gone into the NDDC since the establishment in 1998 or 1999? You know how many trillions? Do you see it when you go to Niger data? No, but you see it in individuals. And therefore they are speaking in one voice. And that one voice is that of concept and silence. That's what they have in. So, I am the convener of the alternative approach to the development of Niger data. And I have said it over and over again that you don't need a buru, a large buru like the NDDC to develop the Niger data. You go the Marshall Plan, just a little office in the presidency made up of about five people or so. The master plan has been given out. So you do a general survey how many kilometers of road you need across the region? How long will it take to do them? How many uh, boreholes or uh, portable water provision facilities you need in that area? And so on. When you map them out, you place them on the dashboard, you put a time lag. So, and you contract it out over a period. So mm. that bureau of about three or five people will now be supervising it year by year year after year, you reach a milestone, they come and take it, you have done that. And you dedicate a volume, a percentage of the oil production of that data, to dedicate that uh, percentage for the payment to the contractors who will be giving these things out. And of course, to get the, the workers to be there, people of the region will be recruited in the contract, in the, by the contractors, carry out these functions and so forth. That's it. But they are, they are people are silent about it. So they are speaking with one voice. All they right. like the situation as it is. And like my gentleman once said, you give this contract out, oh, they are making money out of it. They make sure it's perpetual. Amnesty, mm -hmm. amnesty was, not a, was not a perpetual thing. was not meant by Briar Adwa to be perpetual. It was not to be an endless thing. Train the people for this period, give you a skill, you get out. You train and get out. And many of the so-called militants were never militants. And many of the guns who were, who, who, they say some militants surrendered, were never guns. These were Whoa. day guns. We know them. We read, we, we see them. We are from Niger Delta. Day guns, you just pick, say, oh, you get day guns for house, oh, you bring, you go somewhere like that, somewhere like that. Wow. They were not, many of them were not really guns. We are not the kind of guns that could threaten, threaten the military. And many of the people, like he said, we are not being, the real militants were there up to, the mili real militants that really caused the whole thing that brought the whole thing that, they were there up to 2000. They were not up to that. But if you look at today, you read here when you said 1,600 1, mm. leaders. You said leaders. Militant who, leaders. Those mm. are leaders. Who are those people? If, if you had that one, every leader should be leader about five or ten people. So multiply that. Wow. You really need to have all those kind of people. That's some eye opener right there. Yeah. So that is the thing we are saying. We are right. there. Many, many, a large percentage of them were no militants, never had gone, never participated, never went to the grave. Mm. But you created the room for them. You made the perpetual 60,000 naira every month. That's about two times minimum wage. 64,000. 
that's that's more than minimum wage for the civil servant for that person. So why wouldn't they put themselves there? Put my wow. name there. Put my name there. All right. <laughs> he made it open. My young man, they made it open, and he was right about it. Was right pinpoint. The guy said, "This is the thing, and these are the things government should listen to." Mm. If we listen to that and we are sincere with what we do, we can make this country, we can make the situation better than it is today. Awesome. Even the people who are perpetuating it will simply laugh and say, oh, they don't catch us. They will step down. <laughs> let's surrender. <laughs> let's let's surrender. Finally. They don't catch All right. us. Finally. All right. Now, let's get your final words, Engineer Teve, on this. Various governments have come and gone and tried to solve this menacing activities. Now, what in your own thoughts, since you are always there, on ground, what in your own thought is the best solution to all of this quagmire? Yeah, the best solution is for our government to be sincere with the people and also try to put our money where it's supposed to go. They created NDDC, as he's saying, NDDC has not created that kind of impact. The originators of the, the unit had in mind when they set it up. So if they are putting money where it's supposed to be, right now the east-west road should have been a dual lane uh, uh, project from One all the way to Lagos. And the economy will, will boom. People will get engaged. Criminality will reduce. Now, why the guys started breaking pipelines is because they saw something is flowing in those pipes and they are not having a feel of it. We don't have more pipelines than Saudi Arabia. In fact, we don't have more pipelines than uh, even Libya. But you never hear about people breaking pipelines in Libya. Why? Because the government believed in the welfare of the people. But here these people see oil workers making a lot of money. They see government making a lot of money from here. They see few people sitting in government offices and becoming fat. And they are here hungry. So it gives them an incentive to go and find a way to be part of the system. All right. So no matter the grammar we speak here, the basic line is that the basic needs of these people must be taken care of. Mm. All right. Because they always be mined in their backyard. Why should they not participate in it? If you go to Oman, go to all these uh, Arabic um, countries where they produce oil. In fact, some of them, they receive, if you are not working, you are entitled to an allowance every month because government has paid to give you a job. That was what the Gaddafi was doing. And the U.S., so it as this man is trying to change the face of Africa, let's kill him. They came after him and destroyed him. Gaddafi said, look, it is my job as a government, as a leader, to provide jobs for people. If this guy doesn't have a job, it's a failure on my part. So I must make his life comfortable. They killed him. Our African, our leaders in Africa, especially in Nigeria, they don't think about you and me. Programs are not designed with you and me in mind, and that is why they fail. All right. The budget of NDDC was 10 times more than state government, yet they couldn't create any impact. I know why they were racketeering there. They will go and get a contract, they will sell it to this person, this one will sell it to this person, this one will sell That's how they were selling contracts on paper. But they were not executing it on ground. So, Quite sad. my final word is that. The solution to our problem is that let the government start thinking about the people. Once we carry people along, make their life better, they are thinking we need to support the government and make things work rather than destroy programs and projects of the government. Thank you. I just hope that 2023 will be that time when Nigerians will actually think out of the bus and then look inward to know the right choice they should make. Thank you so much for joining us, Engineer Teve Atsa. Uh, environment uh, uh, technologies. It's been a wonderful time having this discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sneak Oshari. It's been a wonderful time having this discussion. It's fun. It's always a wonderful time having these two discussions. We always get to learn more <laughs> from you. you. Thank, Thank you so much. You. Thank you. Thank you. All right, viewers, that's where we end this conversation. We have been chatting with Sleek Oshari. He is a Niger Delta activist. He's also an oil and gas expert. And we've also been talking to Engineer Teve Atsa. He is an environmental 
technologies. And it's been a wonderful time here on The Conversation. I'm sure you must have been rightly educated and informed. I will see you again next time. Till I come your way again from the nation's capital, Abuja, I am Annabelle Oji. Whatever you do, stay safe. God bless Nigeria.